Welcome everyone to our Next Gen Talks, the Future of Policing video podcast series, hosted by the National Millennial and Gen Z community. Our conversation today is on Ticket to the Streets, Defund the Police, and the, the pros and cons of the defund movement. I'm Hannah Mitchell, and I'm your conversation host. I'm calling in from Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm a student at Bellarmine University with major in criminal justice and minors in French sociology and African and African American diaspora studies. For our discussion today, we have two guests. Our first guest is Jody Armour, who is the Roy P. Crocker Professor of Law at the University of Southern California. He is a widely published scholar and popular lecturer who studies and teaches on the intersections of race and legal decision-making, as well as tort and tort reform movements. Our next guest is Paige Fernandez, who is the policy, Policing Policy Advisor at ALCU's National. She's also the co-founder and director of multiple chapters in the Together We Stand nonprofit organization, where she aims to dismantle racism, discrimination, and police brutality. So now that we've all been introduced, I'm really excited to jump right into this conversation. I hope that we can all come to an understanding of what the defund movement is, what is demanding, and if it is an effective way to lead us into a new era of police reform. So in defining the um, defund movement, the definition tends to change with each individual. Some say that it means the complete disbanding of police departments, where others say that it means to um, reallocate the police department's funding. And some say it can mean both. Um, seeing that you both come from educated backgrounds on police reform, what do you think it really means to defund the police? And in your perspective, what is the actual definition of defunding the police? Jody, I don't know. Do you want to start? Or I you defer to you first, Paige. Okay, yeah, I can start. Um, I'm really glad that you raised that question. I think coming from the ACLU's perspective, um, we tend to use language around divestment, uh, specifically because defund the police was really a term that was um, created by Black-led organizations that treat defunding as a step along the way to the complete abolition of police. And so the ACLU is not an organization that is completely abolitionist as of right now. Um, you know, we're always growing and evolving. And so we don't use the term defund the police. Um, we don't want to water down that demand. And so I think from my perspective, defund the police is a step along the way. What the ACLU really talks about in the language we use is around divestment, <clears throat> which we believe is a uh, shift of power and funding resources and responsibility away from the punitive and harmful system and institutions of policing and into life-affirming community-based, community-led supportive services. So it really means dramatically reducing the role of police in the United States um, and then reallocating those savings to alternatives to police and to communities that have historically been targeted by police. So I saw you mentioned that you would like reallocate it to a more community-based type of program and it would kind of reduce the amount of policing in communities. Can you explain what that would look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to give like context of what policing looks like right now in this country, every year police make over 10.3 million arrests in the United States. Um, only 5% of those arrests are for what we would consider the most serious offenses. Um, so things like rape, aggravated assault, um, and murder. So 95% of the arrests made every year are for significantly low-level offenses, often nonviolent offenses as well. Um, and so what we're talking about is really, it's a multi-pronged um, strategy, right? We need to reduce the roles and responsibilities of police um, and the criminalization of a range of offenses that are in place to target Black and Brown communities, disabled communities, um, and trans communities as well. Um, but what we can reinvest in, I mean, truly the list is endless. Some examples of stabilizing and nourishing programs that we could invest in include restorative and transformative justice programs that 
address abuse and harm without relying on the criminal legal system and other punitive measures. Um, public education, I think the school to prison pipeline is pretty well known. Um, getting police out of schools and replacing them with mental health counselors, with nurses, with social workers, things like affordable housing and mental health services. I think the mental health services is huge, ensuring that police are not responding to people when they're in crisis. And there are examples across the country, like Cahoots in Eugene, Oregon, and SAFE program in Denver, which was piloted in 2020, that have alternative response teams that respond to people in crisis. Oh, thank you for that. I really think that gives us some insight into, as to what we can uh, look forward to as the Defund movement. And you, Jody, do you have a particular opinion or insight into what you think the Defund movement means? Yeah, I have no problem at all with the Defund the Police language in terminology that's used by, been used by activists effectively. And I don't like to tone police activists or police the, the usages they come up with, the models, the slogans that they come up with to promote their uh, really just uh, and righteous cause as it's turned out that many Californians, for example, and Angelinos were moved by what the folks did in the streets over the summer with that generational upheaval we saw here in LA six weeks in a row, day in and day out. And their demands were defund the police were among those demands. And people were saying things like, oh, don't say defund the police. That's going to be misinterpreted. And that's bad political messaging. And why don't you stay away from that and come up with some other um, more anodyne language and, and, and slogans and I remember hearing the exact same council coming from a lot of the same quarters when Black Lives Matter started, right? Um, mm -hmm. Don't say Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. Why are you talking just about Black Lives? You know, why are you gonna, why are you gonna segregate it like that and zero in all, all, all along understanding that what it meant was Black Lives Matter, comma, also. Black Lives Matter, comma, T-O-O. -O. There was an implied ellipsis that people wanted to try to play, act like they could not comprehend. And so all lives matter. And then to show that they really did understand, but they were faking all the time, they came up with the blue lives matter. Well, blue lives matter. Well, I thought you just said all lives matter. Now blue lives matter. Oh, yeah. So it, you, weren't, you weren't serious about that all along. And so the messaging is, you know, we get caught up in the messaging um, and, and what they mean is not just unbundle the police. You know, when I'm talking to some uh, groups, you know, who have a lot of sensitivities about this, I'll just say unbundle the police, which says the exact same thing, but uh, get you the exact same place. But I like defund better because it points to, uh, to the fact that we're not just talking about refunding other programs like education, like health care, like housing, like adequate job, like the things that create the criminogenic conditions in the first place, right? We're not just talking about refunding those programs, but getting police out of our neighborhoods, getting these paid violence workers, which is what police are. They're violent, professional violence workers. We give them a gun with live ammunition, a stun gun, mace, a billy club, handcuffs. They are violence workers. And we're saying we want to minimize their imprint in our, in their, their footprint in our neighborhoods and in our lives. So defund, shrink the police. At the same time, you're taking that money and refunding the programs that have been starved thanks to this bloated punishment bureaucracy that you've been channeling all our public funds into for so long. Oh, thank you for that. And I completely appreciate and share, I believe, the same passion as you do about the reasons behind it. But I feel as though some people, like you said, they get caught up in the messaging or they get caught up in the ellipsis behind it and don't really look at the reason why it's important. So why do you think it's absolutely necessary or why is there a reason that people are asking to defund the police? Well, because we found that every other intervention failed. And I was one of the people early on that was a real booster for certain interventions. My early scholarships and my earliest work was on unconscious bias. Before anybody talked about implicit bias, we were talking about um, bias, you know, um, embedded in the cognitive unconscious, right? And use social cognition research 
information processing approaches to human cognition to identify it, replicate it in the laboratory and prove its existence, right? And I used to run around the country talking to police um, departments, uh, corrections officers, places saying, oh, here's the solution, unconscious, body. recognize that we have it and then regulate it, self-regulate it, control your unconscious bias. And that is, that, that's the solution to the problem. I've come to woe those words and repent of a lot of the earlier stuff I did. The studies show very plainly now that there's very little you can do to de-bias yourself. It's not that it doesn't exist, it exists, but self-regulation of mental reflexes and unconscious bias is next to impossible to do. So if you wanna minimize the harm from you know, police officers is not trying to you know, come up with more implicit bias training or de-escalation training or um, you know, um, community policing or body cams. All of that has proven, that all that was going on with, in, in Minneapolis with respect to the George Floyd fo folks and it didn't, so it didn't uh, solve a thing, it didn't prevent a thing. What we realize now is those fixes, those reforms are inadequate we need to minimize the contacts between these violence workers who are part of this punishment bureaucracy and members of socially marginalized groups. Yes, thank you for that. And one word that you hit on for me was violence. And I think we have seen a lot of violence recently with police brutality, more specifically towards the people of color in the United States. And so I feel like I can resonate with many people on why we feel that we need to defund the police because like, my peers and I, we are one to constantly fight for right. We are constantly seen protesting in the streets and we have witnessed, witnessed that violence firsthand or through social media, as you said, and you, we want to be able to shrink it. And it's like, some people can say that there's violence, but some people, like you said, don't experience it. And so because of that, I think we've come to understand different definitions of what the defund movement is asking or what is demanding. And that's why you hit on is that there's different messaging that comes with it. And so Paige, I wanted to ask you as someone who works in policing and policy, why do you think there is a reason behind the different definitions or a reason behind the different viewpoints on this subject? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a matter of people really coming along to the idea. Um, and I think you know, I'm really excited. So I can say like in my professional work at the ACLU, I use the term divestment because that is the word that the ACLU uses. And because we really work very closely with our black abolitionist partners and ensure that any language we're do using as like a historically white institution is supporting and uplifting the work of black organizers and advocates and not undermining the work in any way. But in my personal capacity as like Paige Fernandez, a human, I am a full-blown abolitionist. And I think it is really important that we're at this point talking about what does defund mean? What does abolition mean? Because people just honestly... I think prior to the summer, many folks didn't even know that, right? And when Jody was saying, you know, how he's come a long way from like, Jody, first of all, we need to connect because my dad does implicit bias work too. Saw that you went to Harvard and Berkeley. My dad did too. I'm sure you guys have a connection there. Um, but I, when I first got into this work, like having worked with my dad for so many years prior to this, you know, was thinking about things like body cameras, implicit bias trainings, things that we kind of refer to as like procedural justice reforms around what do we do after something goes wrong? How do we increase transparency and accountability? But we're at the point where it's like, we need to be discussing what happens before. How do we ensure that the police are not killing over a thousand people per year, three people per day, right? Um, and, you know, something I think is very exciting for me is just kind of more people learning about this um, and the importance of us continuing to use the radical language around defund and abolition, right? Um, and people are like, oh gosh, that's so radical. That's so drastic. Yeah, it is. Because the police violence in this country, the police oppression in this country, the policing institutions at its core are racist and oppressive. So we need a radical response in response to an institution that literally came out of slave patrols, right? Like we are talking about an institution that was developed to ensure enslaved people didn't rebel against their freaking masters. So we have to be radical. And, you know, 
something I'm excited about is that Mariam Kaba's book on abolition is number nine on the New York Times bestseller list this week, right? Like who would have thought a year ago that a book on complete abolition of police and prisons would be number nine on the New York Times bestseller list. So I think it's really important that we push out these radical ideas and bring people along. Um, and something that I love that Miriam Kaba says is like, we are only restricted by our imaginations and lack of creativity um, and really trying to pressure people to expand their minds. Um, as Angela, sorry, I'm quoting all my favorite people, but Angela Davis says, you know, in the United States, police and prisons are given like life and death. And why is that the case? Why is that the case in this country? We really need to push beyond that and make people imagine a new world. Oh, thank you for that. And I think it's really important for our audience, especially the Gen Z, but also the older communities to understand the education behind um, the defund movement and why it is necessary because of the roots of systematic racism that do come with police militarization that we have seen. And which is why you guys commented on the de-escalation or the body camps and stuff like that. We have seen, we have tried, and yet it has not working. And so I think it's good to understand the definition of what is demanding and why it is necessary. But I also want to delve a little deeper into the doubts behind it for those who are kind of on the edge of like, why do we need to do this? Why are we going here? And like, part of that is because 2020 has been shown to be one of the most violent years in the U.S. in decades. And because of that, large cities are seeing an increase in violent crime. So some would say that this is something that would be the absolute worst thing we could do right now. But some activists are also saying that this is what would make us safer. This is something that needs to be done now. So because of that, I want to know if either of you agree with those statements that it is the worst thing that we could do now or that it's necessary to do now. And why is it necessary to do now instead of any time later in the future? Jody, I don't know. Okay. Sorry, you're muted. I don't know. Yeah, you're muted. Uh, yeah. It's um, thank you. It's necessary to do now and any other time you can do it. Um, you, it it's necessary to um, now think of alternatives because I think that's your question, isn't it? Why uh, would we, at a time when, when violent crime is on the rise, why would we talk about defunding an institution, the police, that we think have solutions to violent crime. Well, who says they have solutions to violent crime? When did we ever get the idea in our head that police are the solution to, to crime in general, violent crime in particular? We just take that as an article of faith without any empirical evidence. And when you look at the empirical evidence, it doesn't shore up that claim. It doesn't support that proposition when you look at it, right? That, you know, really what um, promotes safety is keeping people out of desperate circumstances that cause them to turn to desperate undertakings like crime in the first place, right? Um, and so if you do something about spending on criminogenic conditions, relieving people of, you know, joblessness and houselessness, and, you know, when, you're, when your stomach is rumbling, it's hard to think about your civic obligations to society that's cast you in a situation that has allowed you to suffer these stomach you know, rumblings. At the same time, you're supposed to feel some kind of obligation to society, your debt to society. What has society done for you? You know, when, we, when, we, when folks were marching this summer um, in the streets and there, you know, there, were some, there were some fires and some looting, people were saying, well, how could they do that? You know, uh, uh, how, could they, how could they do that to a country that you know, to, to, to the country that's been so good to them. And, you know, I was wondering at the time, you know, you're asking them to care about a nation that hasn't cared about them, shown any care and concern for them, right, at all. So, yeah, I, um, I kind of want to start, you know, kind of start there, you know, with that kind of background um, proposition that we can be more safe by eliminating the criminogenic conditions that cause people to be tempted to turn to crime in the first place, um, and rather than spending that money on police. Here's what police are doing, okay? We put a, a lot more police in New York to go after turnstile jumpers. Here in California, we, as part of the Safe, Safe Cities Initiative in 2006, 
We put 80 new police officers in Skid Row to crack down on the down and out and solve the problem of homelessness through police intervention, right, which is a total failure. We wasted hundreds of millions of dollars doing that. And, you know, it didn't make us safer as a, as a community. So it isn't about more, more police making us more safe. We got to we got to figure that one out real clearly and then spend on stuff that really does make us safe. No, thank you for that. And I completely agree. Honestly, a lot of people look at the U.S. and they wonder why we have such high amount of enforcing police. But you would think with that, that we, we would be one of the safest countries in the world when that's completely opposite, and especially towards people of color who are disproportionately impacted by this police brutality. And it's more of our system is punishing people rather than preventing things that should be prevented before we go to crime. And that's something that I think people need to look at instead of look at preventive justice instead of punitive justice. And that's why we have mass incarceration and mass death rates towards people of color in this country. And which is why we've noted that many people of color are leaning towards this movement, leaning towards defunding the police, because they've seen that in these years that we've been here, that they are disproportionately impacting us. And it is because um, I noticed you called it um, the new Jim Crow in one of your books too, in referencing that. And I think it's completely true is that we are still here in the, like the shackles, I believe that they put on us, but they're not seen. It's more of through the system. And I think that needs to be addressed. And so that is why we noticed that many people of color are looking for many ways as possible. And they like to say, um, why are you being violent? Why are you burning cities? Why are you doing this? But for people who aren't historically violent people, I think it's clear to see that it's not the violence uh, from the people of color that's the issue, it's the violence to the people of color that's the issue. And so because of that, I want to know what are the outcomes or consequences you see as um, a result of defunding the police? Hannah, can I actually jump in on the last question around like violent crime? I think there's, I hate this narrative that's going around. I just saw that there was a new academic study that was put up that said, you know, following the protests this summer, there was a significant rise in crime. And it just like made my blood boil, implying that it was like the protest and the demands to defund the police that were the problem. Um, I have like a few points that I want to hit on, which is one that like, COVID. And we know that COVID has disproportionately impacted BIPOC communities across this country. We know that Black women have been disproportionately laid off from their jobs. We know that Black men are suffering. We know that our unhoused rates are drastically increasing. Um, And I feel like not acknowledging the role that COVID has played um, in these rise in crime. I mean, I will get into what I think about crime in a second crime in quotes. Um, But the fact that we are not acknowledging COVID as a huge factor and why these crime rates might be increasing, I think is really absurd, honestly. Um, People are not getting the services they need. Our government has failed us consistently, not just our federal government, but our states and local government have failed to come up with policies to ensure that people aren't being negatively impacted by this pandemic. Um, The other point I just want to make is that You know, as you were just saying, Hannah, like police don't prevent anything. And I think that's something that people forget to talk about. Um, Police do not prevent crime. They do not prevent harms from happening. They come in after something has gone wrong. They punish people. That's their job is not to prevent, but to punish people. So to further the trauma, further the harm that's already occurred. And then to, you know, some points Jody was making earlier and Jody articulated it way better than I could. But I think about it as like crime is, first of all, not random. It happens when someone cannot meet their basic needs through any other means and not just economic needs. Um, this, which is why it's so important to be reinvesting in community-based services so we can allow people to, you know, meet their basic needs and provide them with opportunities to thrive. But also crime in this country is a social construct. You know, 
current law creates a mass criminalization of poverty, drug use, trans status, disability status, immigration status. And a lot of these forms of criminalization effectively make it illegal to live while Black. Um, many of our existing criminal laws for which Black people and, and low-income people are targeted and arrested for shouldn't even exist in the first place. And we need to end the enforcement of them. And so, you know, this includes, but isn't limited to, like, drug and marijuana possession, traffic violations, disorderly conduct, school discipline, and other maintenance crimes, um, order maintenance crimes. And then the last point I just want to make about the violence thing, sorry, this conversation <laughs> really gets me heated, um, is that I think like unpacking what violence means, right? And I think also when people say violent crime, like there are a ton of crimes in this country that are categorized as violent that actually involve like no physical bodily injury, right? Nothing that really has extensive harm on another human being. Um, so our idea of like violent crime is really warped, but also that no one who has harmed someone is experiencing harm for the first time. People who often engage in harm and inflict it on other people have been harmed earlier in their lives. So how do we prevent that and prevent this cycle of harm and trauma and abuse? Sorry, that was a long rant. <laughs> no, that was completely valid, honestly, and I agree with... Oh, what were you saying, Jody? I was just going to jump in on a little bit at the end of what Paige was saying because it mm -hmm. dovetails so well with um, what I was trying to get at in my uh, most recent book, In Asterisk GGA Theory, um, Race, Language, Unequal Justice, and the Law. We demonize, monsterize, otherize, inward eyes, if you will, mm -hmm. and it's the way I talk about it in my book. Um, black criminals in particular, right? Um, crime has a black face for most of America. Polls show it over and over again. And violent black criminals in particular, particular, right? Um, and so we, people like uh, Willie Horton was a violent black recidivist is the idea and drove are thinking about criminal justice for a, a you know, generation, over a generation. So we are at a point now where we have to come to grips with how we think about the moral framework that we use to think about violent black criminals. If we don't come up with a new moral compass, a new moral framework when it comes to violent black criminals, and that's what I try to address in my book, we're not going to make any deep cuts in, in racialized mass incarceration because as John Pfaff, P-F-A-F-F, -F -F, points out in his book, Locked In, um, only contrary to what Michelle Alexander said in New Jim Crow, most of, most of the explosion in prison population isn't low-level nonviolent drug offenses. When you look at state prisons, which is where 87% of the prisoners reside, only 5 to 6% of them can be characterized as low-level nonviolent drug offenders. I know when I take my students up to San Quentin, I don't see any. And I've been taking them for years. I haven't seen any, right? What you're talking about, if you're going to make deep cuts in racialized mass incarceration, is many violent offenders rethinking how those people who do engage in real violent offenses, real violent assaults, how or, or, or complicit in them, how we think, how we think about them. Do we move from retribution, retaliation, and revenge as our moral framework for processing them? toward restoration, rehabilitation, and redemption, right? That's the challenge. And, we're, and right now, the new pro progressive DAs who are coming in, like George Gascon, Chesa Boudin, Larry um, Krasner, out in Philadelphia are saying, we're coming in with a new moral framework, restoration, rehabilitation, redemption, and we're rejecting the old one, retribution, retaliation, and revenge. And that, that's where we really have to do our work going, you know, right now. No, I think that's completely important. And something you both hit on is the word criminal. And I want to go a little deeper into that because like Paige was saying, to be Black in this country is to be criminal. You cannot be free in this country as a Black person. And that's why we see the mass incarceration, mass incarceration of people of color, specifically Black men. And it is because we try to, not we, the country tries to um, dehumanize and criminalize people of color as a way to put them in the system as we've seen in the war on drugs, which is made specifically for people of color. And because of that, we have seen the criminalization of using drugs or criminalization of 
poverty, like you said, and as things that disproportionately affect people of color. And that is why we have the mass incarceration of people of color. So going into that, do you think that the decriminalization of these things would be something that we need to look into as part of the defund movement? I don't know, Jody, if you wanted to go first or... Yeah, you go first, Paige. Okay. Yes, I think it's absolutely critical. I think <clears throat> when I think about defunding the police, divesting from the police, I think about it kind of under this larger umbrella of reducing the roles, responsibilities, power, and funding of police, right? And in order to redu reduce their roles and responsibilities and like specifically the role they play in BIPOC communities and low-income communities, we have to decriminalize a range of offenses. Um, but we have to ensure that decriminalization truly means the end of enforcement. We have to, like, there have been places that have decriminalized marijuana where the arrest rates between Black people and white people are still staggering, right? Um, the ACLU, we actually, this time last year, were releasing up a report that showed even in states that have legalized marijuana, there are still staggering disparities in arrest rates. So not only do we need to go into these things and think about how we fully end the enforcement of them, which I think means completely ending the criminalization of these offenses, um, but we also need to be thinking about how we, um, you know, really shrink their role and really ensure that this isn't just another reform and that equality, um, sorry, equity and justice is imperative in any legislation, whether it's on the local level, state level, or federal level. As we've seen in a lot of states that have legalized marijuana, Black and brown people who are disproportionately arrested for marijuana possession and dis distribution are completely left out of the new marijuana industry, do not get to benefit um, or reap the economic benefits of the new marijuana industry. So I do think decriminalization or just ending completely the, um, the criminalization of certain offenses in criminal code um, and legalization are critical, but we have to have an eye toward equity and justice, specifically BIPOC equity in these policies, um, because it's really easy for these policies to end up benefiting white people and not the people most impacted by the system. Oh, thank you for that. And Jody, what do you think on that subject? I agree with everything Paige said. And um, you know, decriminalizing a range of activities is, is, is a big part of the answer, of course. Um, it's obscene how we use penal sanctions as a policy tool in this country, just as an everyday policy tool. It's just the first thing we reach for. You know, we got a social problem. Let's drop this felony hammer on it. All right. And that'll solve it. That'll fix it. Right. And so you have things like when I first started teaching criminal law at USC in 1995, 96, 7, 8, 9, 2000, 2001, 2, 3, all the way up to 2003, I had to teach my criminal law students that it was, un that it was constitutional in a number of states, a large number, significant number of states for the government to tell a same-sex couple that if they exchange intimacy, they could get thrown into a cage and locked up for five or 10 years, all right? It's not until you get to Lawrence v. Texas that the Supreme Court finally says, oh, you know, that's going too far. 2003, after Bowers and Hardwick, they said it wasn't going too far. That we, we, the kinds of things we make criminal, right? The kind of consensual, for, I think how, many, how, much, how much wasted energy and time we've spent on the more, war on weed, marijuana. Think about that right now. You, you can go down the street and get all the Jack Daniels you wanted, but if you got a little Jack Herrera, you know, then you could go to jail or prison, right? The tail of two Jacks, right? And the tail, and what used to be when it came to the first Jack, Jack Daniels, they they said we're going to put this prohibition in the Constitution. We're we're, we're going to make it extra sure. We're going to create a constitutional amendment that you can't sip on that wine spritzer. That wine spritzer is so wicked, so evil, so deleterious to the social well to our social well being that we're, you sip on it and so, somebody's getting locked up. You know, multiple people are getting locked up. And so, when are we going to wake up as a nation to recognizing that there are all kinds of things like that that just simply do not need to be criminalized? Traffic violations are a big, uh, another example. And that 
you can actually get bipartisan support for this. I was at one of the last functions I was at before COVID had us all staying home was a dinner attended by Newt Gingrich, who stood up at the head of the table when he was giving his remarks at the dinner, you know, and he said, this is, I know this is going to surprise uh, Professor Armour here, but if I had my druthers, I would have no one going to jail and doing any time for nonviolent offenses. I'm, I'm not, I'm never crazy about the violent versus nonviolent distinction. So, you know, but still, whoa, you know, I'm saying this is Newt Gingrich, the far right, the right has recognized that we're squandering scarce resources, making spending $80,000 a year in California to lock up somebody for taking a cell phone from the backseat of an unoccupied car or something like that, you know? So uh, b both sides are, uh, are recognizing that, you know, for different reasons that there are, that what we have now is a, is a miserably failed approach to social problems. And hopefully that attitudinal change is going to help us really turn all this around. Oh, thank you for that. And I think you both hit on some key points that our audience needs to um, understand a little bit more about the criminalization of people of color in this country. Moving in a little a bit of a different direction, I wanted to ask if um, both of you, if you do consider yourselves as activists and what do you see as your role in this movement as an activist? I can start. Um... I'm not like, I can't particularly explain why I'm not a big fan of the term activist. And I don't know. It just gives me icky feelings. Like that's the best I can articulate it. I would consider myself like an advocate and at my core community organizer, like in a grassroots organizer. I work for a large national organization, but in my free time organized with an explicitly abolitionist grassroots org here in Philly. Um, and you know, I think I am at an interesting intersection where I'm biracial. My dad is black and my mom is white. And depending on the season, I may or may not be white presenting. Um, so I think, you know, I've been trying to figure out my role in this work. And I think part of it's to have those hard conversations with white people because of my inherent privilege, because of my skin color. Um, to like move them along and to support this movement. Um, and I also see my roles just to, you know, push this movement forward. Um, somebody this week was like, Paige, you are just a truth teller. You always tell the truth, no matter who's in the room. And I'm like that, I have gained a reputation for that, <laughs> but I think it's important. I am firm in my values and will not back down from them. And I think, you know, every day about, our elders and who have come before me, like Angela Davis and Mariam Kaba, who have not backed down from their radical visionary beliefs and who made it possible for people to be on the streets in summer 2020 demanding defunding the police. So I'm still trying to figure out my role, um, but trying to do my best to organize people towards a better world, a better vision for our world, to get people to understand that there is more out there, right? There is a better system out there that doesn't involve arresting people and locking them up. Um, so that's kind of where I think I, I see my role now. Well, that's good. And I think people's roles are always changing with this um, aspiring movement that we are going through as a country. And a lot of times people don't actually know what their role is. Like you said, you kind of just go with it and you see where you want to present yourself. You see your beliefs and your values and you know where you stand and you know with that, you may change maybe your role, but your perspective will not, you know who you are. And I think that's really good for our young generations to hear right now, um, to see that, they're, that they might know, not know exactly what they need to do, but know that they need to do something. And I think that's really important. And so you, um, for you, Jody, how do you um, see your role as in this process? Oh yeah, I'm, I've been characterized as a black identity extremist. I know that, right? As a matter of fact, um, because of my, close associations with Black Lives Matter out here in LA. Black Lives Matter LA is one of the, you know, um, real epicenters of the movement uh, from early on and police were gathering information about associations and uh, Karen Bass had a call them to account you, um, uh, on the Hill, um, the FBI to uh, call them to account about labeling people like me, black identity extremists and gathering information, you know, 
to start another who knows what, COINTELPRO. You know, there's a movie out now about Fred Hampton that shows you where that goes, you know, that kind of COINTELPRO stuff. So I've kind of, I kind of had activism thrust upon me uh, as an eight-year-old when I lost my dad uh, to 22 to 55 years for possession and sale of marijuana. And my family went, you know, the, my seven brothers and sisters and I went from, you know, Cosby, middle-class, kids existence to crumbs and roaches and rats. So I've had, you know, to think about the practical impact of what I'm doing to address those kinds of concerns, you know, that I grew up with. And I tell my students all the time that well, the thing about being a lawyer is you don't, you never get to be an armchair philosopher. You know, there are always stakes in, in the controversy. There's gonna be a winner and a loser. You don't open your mouth ever as a lawyer unless you're trying to persuade somebody of something, right? And so you're real, you know, you're really kind of studying rhetoric and then you have to ask yourself rhetoric to what end? What good are you trying to bring about through your rhetoric? And so, you know, um, what, what my main focus is trying to have us put on a different set of moral lenses when it comes to looking at criminals, especially black criminals, to completely overhaul how we think about blame and punishment, to see that um, you, you can't simply distinguish between victims and victimizers. Many victimizers are themselves victims. Hurt people hurt people. This is one of the things that comes out of my sessions up in San Quentin with my class. And so once we, if we don't make that deep, fundamental moral shift, we can be right back here in five or 10 years. Another Willie Horton case can come up, another Megan or Jessica's Law, you know, kind of a of, of, of victim story. And we can slide right back into retribution, retaliation, and revenge. Because you can't turn on the TV or watch a movie without the plot being about retribution, retaliation, and revenge. And we're being invited to celebrate retribution, retaliation, and revenge. And just by, I was looking at TV, and I'm all at home a lot now watching TV, you know, over the last year. I see all these shows, there's retribution, retaliation, revenge, all of them, you know, just about. And you're in there rooting for some bad person to get his or her comeuppance and, and die slow, suffer, you know, all kinds of things that we don't realize are really feeding the kind of punitive impulses that are driving racialized mass incarceration itself. And they have to be challenged and eradicated at their root with different kinds of art, different kinds of narratives, different kinds of stories. Right. So, yeah, that I see myself very much as an activist. No, thank you for that. And I like how you mentioned, too, that we need to shift perspective, not only as individuals, but as a whole country. And as we do that, like Paige was saying, that we need to push our country towards a more um, police reformed era, a more peaceful era um, in this country. And I believe that all starts with conversation like we're having today. So as we wrap up this discussion, I was wondering if you had any advice or final thoughts for our audience. I can just say that I think every it's really important for people to find their political homes. Um, and I think it takes a while to find that space. Um, but And I also can't over the, overstate the importance of just like community building and community organizing. Um, and there is always work to be done. And sometimes it's really not glamorous and you're not going to be thanked for it all the time. And you're not going to be recognized and you might not be mentioned in the history books, but Everybody has a role to play um, and there is always something to be done. You might not feel like there's somewhere for you to fit in, but I promise you that there are like amazing organizations, community led organizations across this country, particularly black led organizations that are doing phenomenal work that could always use support. Um, if you don't have the time to support give out your money if you have any extra money, you know? Um, so I think, you know, just people finding their political home and finding a community and starting building that community power is key here. Yeah, I, I, I need to agree with Paige, that's all, you know, this is, this is a, a time of people power like none I've seen in my lifetime, right? This is a time uh, when you see grassroots activism cashing out in transformational change like I've never seen, you know, here in LA, I just talked about here in LA where I am, after those streets were taken over for six weeks in a row, right, um, day in and day out, we saw at the ballot box, 
the voters oust Jackie Lacey, a traditional law and order prosecutor, tough on crime, black, first black woman prosecutor in L.A. County, and replace her with George Gascon, a progressive prosecutor with a whole different set of agendas that he came in and started implementing with directives, by the way, to prosecutors that his own prosecutors started suing him about, trying to resist the, the, the reforms that the voters had elected him to bring about. Um, and I also saw the voters uh, um, uh, get behind Measure J, which was a defund the police, a measure right on there. And that's how we talked about it out here. We made no bones about it. When we were in the street going door to door, defund the police. You know, it was, wasn't called that on the ballot measure, but it was essentially we were saying defund the police. And what it does is it takes 10% of the LA County unrestricted budget, which is up to $10 billion a year, the budget itself. So that's up to a billion dollars a year that's dedicated to incarceration alternatives, right? That's people power. That's grassroots activism, uh, you know, tr uh, translating into triumph at the ballot box and, and truly transformational change. Thank you both so much for sharing. And like you said, there is a, a great power in community. And I think everybody needs to find their spot, find their role, like you said, in their community. That was all for our episode of Next Gen's Talks, the video podcast. Thank you once again, Jody and Paige for coming here to share today. We really value your opinion. And, and for everyone out there watching, we hope you finally come to a better understanding of what the defund movement is, what is demanding and why it's necessary. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you next time. Welcome back everyone to Next Gen Talks, the future policing video podcast series hosted by the National Gen Z and Millennial Community. We will be continuing our conversation on Take It to the Streets, Defund the Police, the pros and cons of the Defund Movement. My name is Hannah Mitchell and I'm your conversation host. I'm calling in from Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm a student at Bellarmine University and I major in criminal justice with minors in French, sociology, and African and African American diaspora studies. Our guest today is Shelley Zimmerman, who is a retired police chief from the San Diego De P Police Department. She served 35 years with the police department and is now a chancellor appointee at the National University where she focuses on public safety and leadership. So now that we've all been introduced, we can go ahead and jump right into the discussion. I'm looking forward to gaining a new perspective on the defund movement and hopefully coming to an understanding of what it means for the future of police reform. So as someone who was a former police officer and police chief, what does it mean to you when you hear about the defund movement? How would you define it? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on, Hannah. It's uh, wonderful to uh, to meet you, to see you virtually via, via Zoom here. Um, and I will tell you, uh, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity because, you know, we all learn and share from each other. The, the more that we can talk um, and find common ground, the better it is for everyone. So really appreciate this, this opportunity. Um, before I get into that, I just want to spend just a couple seconds and talk a little bit about my background. Uh, mm -hmm. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And so how does someone who grow, grow up in Cleveland, Ohio, end up being the chief of police of the San Diego Police Department? I'll tell you, said a, uh, a football game changed my life. Uh, back in 1980, when I was a junior at The Ohio State University, uh, some friends and, and myself, we uh, came to uh, California to watch Ohio State play in the Rose Bowl. And I guess you could say that I'm a product of tourism because I used to see the commercials for the San Diego Zoo and uh, when I was freezing back in Cleveland and we took a side trip to San Diego and went to the, the zoo and then went to some of uh, the beautiful beaches here in San Diego and I made a decision right then and there that I had shoveled my last driveway. Uh, returned to Ohio State, graduated. And then after graduation, uh, where I uh, obtained my degree in criminology, criminal justice, um, came to San Diego and uh, quite frankly, I jumped on a plane with $200 in my pocket, one suitcase on my guitar. And when I got off the plane in San Diego, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have a job. I didn't even have a place to stay. Uh, I used to tell people, don't worry as your police chief when I would give this talk, uh, I plan much better now. I, I mostly put myself through Ohio State, like a lot of you know the students that are uh, participating in this series, you know, likely are, are helping uh, to put themselves, if not all the way, some of the way through college. Uh, same with me. And uh, I always thought I would follow my father's footsteps, who was a trial attorney in Cleveland, and go to law school. 
And that's still what I thought I would do when I moved to San Diego. I saw that the San Diego Police Department was hiring and I joined the police department thinking that that job would pay for law school. But from day one of the academy, I fell in love with being a police officer and I never went to law school. And 35 years later, I retired as the chief of police. Um, I could probably give you thousands of reasons why I love being a police officer, but I'll, I'll, I'll just give you one now to start this conversation. Um, you know, you take San Diego PD, on average, the communication center at the San Diego Police Department gets about 1.4 million calls to their communication center every year on average. Let's face it, nobody calls the police because something good happened. You know, they called the police because something, something bad happened and they need a police response. So as a police officer, you have an opportunity every single day and usually multiple times a day to make a positive difference in someone's life usually at their worst possible time when they call for, for help. And so that's very, very powerful. Um, and that plays into now, you know, my thinking as your first question was, you know, what is, what do I think when I hear defunding the police? And I think that's number one, you know, quite the issue is when you, you probably could ask 10 different people, what do you think it means when someone says defunding the police? you are likely going to get 10 different answers as to what somebody thinks uh, defunding the police means. So, you know, I'll pause for a second because we can get into some of these different suggested or possible uh, definitions of what defunding the police is. No, thank you for that. And I especially appreciate you giving us a little bit of your background into becoming a police officer and finding yourself at the San Diego Police Department. And I definitely agree that there are many differing definitions um, to defunding the police. I've come to understand it as the reallocation of police funding towards community programs. And so when looking at that, we're seeing that we're taking money away from typical police funding and moving it towards like health programs and educational programs and things of that nature. So as someone who kind of has the insight into police funding, where do you think it typically goes on like a day-to-day -day basis? And if it was reallocated towards those community programs, uh, what do you think would be affected and would it be positive or negative, do you feel? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Very insightful question. Um, so let me give a little bit of background is, you know, and again, I, I'm pretty much talking from the, about since I was the chief for the San Diego Police Department, but I think, you know, what I'm about to say as far as budget is likely for the majority, vast majority of time, all of the police departments, the majority of your budget is personnel expenses. I would say 85 to 90% of your police department budget goes to personnel expense, which means that only leaves 10 to maybe 15% of other funding and some are mandated funding that you must do. Um, so very small percentage really uh, could go toward discretionary funding. Um, and so when someone talks about, you know, we're going to defund the police, you know, department, we're going to take millions of dollars away. And you're, you're seeing this across the country, what some of the uh, outcomes can be. Majority of the time, it's going to mean layoffs. Because again, the majority of your budget is personnel expenses. So if you're going to take a large percentage of your police department budget away, you are likely going to uh, face layoffs. Um, you know, I, I think about something that, that Chief Carmen Best, uh, the former chief of Seattle said, um, you know, at the, toward the end of last year, when the Seattle City Council was talking about defunding the police department, you know, maybe up towards, you know, 50%. And, and she said, this would be catastrophic. Not only would it mean, you know, um, a large number of layoffs, but it would be, you know, negatively affect public safety. Um, you know, she also talked about that, you know, who would be those that would be laid off? And this would, this is generally, I think for, for all police departments, it's the last hire, would be the first to be laid off. And, you know, she had talked about that, 
uh, their city council had allocated a significant amount of money, you know, more than a million dollars uh, to, you know, go out and find the, the best, the brightest, and the most diverse to be Seattle police officers. And the hypocrisy of, of defunding, you know, their department so much would be that the most diverse would be the first ones that would be laid off. Um, and so, you know, not only that, but they never even, you know, spoke to her about this. And what would that be, you know, the city council? So, you know, they ended up losing a reform minded chief, you know, Chief Carmen Best decided to retire. So here she is, is the first African American uh, female police chief of Seattle. And, you know, some of the decisions that their city council was making, um, you know, they ended up losing her. Um, so it's such a bigger issue than just saying, you know, let's defund the police department. There are so many consequences uh, about defunding. Um, I think, you know, so uh, quite frankly, you know, that's, you know, definition that you talked about what that looks like, but some people do want to abolish the police department. You know, think about the, the CHAZ zone or the CHOP zone or the autonomous zone that they don't want any police. Um, so, although, you know, most people, I think, you know, that really take the time to study this and be the critical thinkers are, are talking about what is, like you said, what is the reimagine? What, what do we want that to look like? Um, and I will tell you this from my point of view is that I think we can find a lot of consensus and a lot of common ground by taking this approach. And, and here's what I'm gonna say is that society has safety nets and society's safety nets when somebody's in crisis could be a drug counselor, could be a psychiatrist, could be a social worker. But let's face it, those entities are not working 724 or 365 days a year, right? Um, those entities and many other entities to assist our community and, and individuals that are in crisis, um, quite frankly, they, are, they have a lot of holes in them. Uh, and that safety net is broken. And the person has fallen through those safety nets into the only entity that is there, 724, 365 days a year, and that's called the police officer. Um, so I think we can get a lot of bit, uh, a lot of, quite a bit of consensus on shoring up those safety nets, crisis. Uh, you know, drug counselors, you know, psychiatrists, social workers, and, and other entities to assist individuals long before they fell through the net and that a police response would ever be needed. And I, I often say that, you know, police officers are not just first responders. They are often the only responders to the myriad of society's challenges. So this isn't about taking money away from the police department. It's about putting money into these other entities of our community, because police officer is part of the community. It's not either or, we're part of this, it's the we, that to shore up these other entities. And that's gonna cost more money, not less money. And so how did we even get here? Is that for so long, these other entities weren't funded and the police officer was expected to handle, you know, all of these society's uh, struggles and challenges. So I think from a police officer's perspective, and certainly myself as the former chief of police of the San Diego Police Department, um, it would be welcome to find the money, not from a police department's budget, but to find the money to shore up these society safety nets to help our community members uh, before a police response would ever be needed. No, thank you for breaking that down for us. And I think me and others in the community would not have quite understood the behind the scenes, I would say, of police funding. And I definitely think we need to look at if they were to defund and reallocate that funding and maybe even take it from the police department, where would those former police officers go that you mentioned who would be laid off? And so I definitely think that's something that we would need to look at. But I know that also in the community, as from a protester perspective and someone who's out there with Black Lives Matter, they kind of believe that police funding is going towards, you said, more personnel, um, 
personal expenses, which we can see that you can have more weapons that we feel as though we're seeing in reaction to the protests with like rubber bullets, tear gas, plastic shields, all of that stuff that police use to defend themselves at the protests. And those are all things that feed into the imagery and violence of what people refer to as police militarization. And studies have shown that because of that police violence, that 1,039 people in 2020 alone were murdered by police and 28% of them were black and only black people only make up 13% of the US. So we're seeing that disparity in those percentages, but also that black people have been three times more likely to be killed by police than white people with the use of those extra weapons and extra violence and 1.3 more times likely to have been unarmed. And we saw this with the murder of people like Eric Garner, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many, many more. And so we've seen that like with those deaths that um, I looked up some studies too, and they show that 98.3% of the police killings um, between 2013 and 2020 resulted in no criminal charges for the officers involved. So we're seeing that we're putting more and more money into an organization that yes, has contact with lots of people in the public, especially through the protests, but even when things go wrong and we're seeing injustice and we're seeing violence and we're seeing um, murder, especially of black and brown people in America, uh, as a result of that, many of the people in the community no longer view the police as safety. They no longer view them as a form of public safety, but rather as a threat. And I know you are someone who regards public safety with the utmost esteem as someone who was a former police chief and it also works with this nonprofit organization where you work with public safety. So do you see that, do you understand that the police are safe or do you believe that they are doing more good in the, good in the community than harm? Well, you know, you had, you had made, it was quite a long statement with a lot of those things, you know, that, you know, statistics and things that you had brought up. Um, and, and I so appreciate, you know, having the opportunity to have this conversation with you. Uh, a lot to, a lot to discuss. And I don't think we have the time for every, every, you know, point that, that you were making, but let me, let me try to talk about, about this is that we need to work together. There, there are 18,000 police departments across our country. And obviously we're not all the same, okay? Um, and so it's very important that the police department work with their community. I you know, would like to always say, and I say it all the time, public safety must be a shared responsibility. It's not just the police, it's not just the community. It's all of us must work together. Um, you know, some people don't you know, wanna see the militarization a, a police department. They don't want them to have the equipment um, in order to, to uh, you know, some equipment in order to go out and and do their job. They think it looks, you know, more militaristic. And and it's to me, it's not so much the equipment; it's the policy behind the equipment. Because the reason why you get that equipment is for for safety. Okay. And so, but what is the policy behind it? because you need to have a very robust policy again, um, you know, to make sure that it is used appropriately. Um, but uh, just to say, you know, it's militaristic, we don't want you to have that equipment. I think, you know, that, that's, that's too easy. You know, that, that's just too easy to say you, you, you shouldn't have the equipment. You need to sit down and um, have these conversations, understand the policy of what that looks like. Um, we have seen terrible things across our country, um, without a doubt. I don't shy away from that. As a matter of fact, you know, when I watched the video of George Floyd, my heart broke. My heart absolutely broke. And I will tell you, I haven't spoken to one police officer locally or across our country that thinks what happened was okay. Nobody thinks that I've spoken to think, thinks that that was okay. You know, and I would tell you, when I came on in 1982, um, you wouldn't have seen the massive outcry from police departments, from chiefs to rookies, to those wanting to get into the profession that those have been on the police department for quite some time, speaking out so publicly. Uh, and you, 
saw so many uh, police officials uh, of all ranks, and again, and associations and unions speaking out uh, how wrong that was. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot to talk about, but I will I will say this is that we we have to work together um, to provide the best police services uh, services possible. And here we talk about again funding and discretionary funding. A lot of times that that funding goes to training, and I think we can all agree that hopefully we can agree that you know we want your police officers to have the best training possible. And it, you can't just say, well, you took this class and therefore you're trained. You know, what was best practices when I became a police officer in 1982? A lot of that is not best practice today, right? And what is considered a best practice today for public safety is likely not gonna be considered a best practice maybe even five years from now for public safety. So it must be constant training, constant learning uh, new things. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. And that's where, again, working with the community. Um, and I think a lot of this, Hannah, boils down to communication, is that if our community doesn't understand why we're using a, some piece of equipment, then they're less likely to trust that piece of equipment or uh, the reason on why we're using it. And again, that goes back to communicating, building that trust. Um, and that will, you know, that can never be defunded, you know, that, that trust building. We must continue to work on that. Um, I, and I just, I want to ask you a question. You know, I do a lot of before COVID, I was, you know, traveling the country and speaking on a lot of public safety topics and leadership. You know, it's a little more difficult, you know, via Zoom, but, you know, I'm still so glad that we're able to have these conversations using technology. But let me ask you a question. How often do you think that a San Diego police officer uses force to affect an arrest or a lawful detention? Um, I honestly don't have the information I would say to answer that correctly because I did not look into the background, I guess I would say, of the San Diego crime rates and all of that. But I do know I that- you a guess about how often do you think a, an officer uses force on the San Diego Police Department? You know, it kind of goes back to your other question about things that you have seen and, and uh, across our country. So I would hope that it would not be a lot, but I do have a feeling that it, and I feel that it's the same with most police departments, that we see a lot of force towards people who are black, towards people who are brown, but maybe not so much towards people who are white. So I kind of, I, going into this conversation and uninformed, I don't want to misjudge okay. the police department or anything like that, but I definitely feel like it's a high percentage of amount that is towards um, black and brown people in America because it's easy to get away with. We're not seeing results. We're not seeing punishments with that. So going into that, I would definitely feel like it's a lot towards people who are black and brown. But if you look at maybe towards people who are white, I'd probably say it's, but it's, it's a general term, not breaking it up, you know, as far as race, but it's a of a general term. Like I said, we get about 1.4 million calls a year into our communication center. You know, we come in contact with I don't know, tens of millions of people every year. And, you know, so I was just curious, and I asked this question, not just of you, but when I do these, when I have this presentation, I, I, I ask people, you know, not breaking it up by race or gender or, you know, so, social economic or any of that, but just in general, to affect an arrest or lawful detention. And, and, and so I'll just cut to the chase. I've heard his answers when I've asked this as high as, you know, 25 or more percent of the time. The reality is, and I, and I usually when I do this, I you know, have a Zoom presentation with a, with a PowerPoint and all this, and I show a slide. And it's, it's less than 1% of the time uh, that uh, any, force is, any force is used to affect an, an arrest or a lawful detention. And, and then I ask a question on why, particularly those that thought it was so high, um, why they thought it was so high. And what you had just said is because that's what you see all the time. You know, you, you know, especially now with social media and 724 
um, you know, everybody is online or on their smartphones or, you know, whatever they're doing, they, they, they see that all the time. Do you think that that plays into, into why some might think that it was higher? Um, I definitely think what we see on social media plays into our beliefs of how much violence is used by police officers. But I also believe that we put such a high number is because a lot of that I feel is unreported. Um, I've read a couple articles on police departments and we've seen how things such as like politics and kind of like the hierarchical order of police departments and to look good um, for their community. So you have more tourism, you have more things, you have more money, which results in more money towards police departments. We believe that things are unreported and they're unmarked or they're under underreported if that. And I definitely know as someone who is black and who has had friends, who has had encounters with police, who, who I myself has had encounters with police um, and protests, I definitely believe that a lot of violence is unreported. It's not wrote, written down and that's why we believe it's a much higher percent than is showing in the numbers that um, you listed off is less than 1%. Yeah, you know, um, you bring up an interesting, um, you know, again, you know, topic and, and this conversation is, you know, very, very excellent. Um, you know, when I became chief in 2014, I, I absolutely believed in body cameras. Um, and I think that that is a, a very important tool and, you know, very, um, you know, Mayor Faulkner was the mayor at the time and our city council, um, you know, spent millions of dollars to outfit, you um, our police officers with, with body cameras. And at one point, you know, San Diego is the eighth largest city in our country. At one point, um, you know, San Diego had more body cameras uh, on their officers than I think the 10 largest cities combined at one point. And the reason why was, you know, the reason for that, and I want to tell you a little story about this, is that I, I believe in body cameras. I think, um, you know, it helped to build trust um, you know, if, if we have a rogue officer, we want to know that, but also if the officer's right, uh, we also want to know that, you know, so it's a win-win for the community. It's a win for our police department. You know, we don't want false complaints, but yeah, if an officer is doing wrong, we want to know that too. Um, and so um, I, I asked the division that was going to help implement this to go and take a look to see what other policies were out there, because to my other point, we're going to need a robust policy, right? You know, for these body cameras. And so uh, they came back, you know, a little bit later and said, basically, Chief, you know, there's not a, you know, quite frankly, there's really no other big city police department, same big city by population of their city um, that has implemented this program. We're going to be the first. And Hannah, I can't even tell you how many people inside the department and outside the department um, cautioned me. And quite frankly, I'd say discouraged me for going forward, forward with the body camera saying, if we were not perfect on day one, that you know, we would be criticized you know, for spending all this money and, and everything else. And, and here's what I said, we're not going to be perfect on day one, okay? This is gonna be new technology, but we're certainly gonna be able to make forward progress. So yes, we're gonna to continue to go forward. And, <clears throat> Um, I will tell you is that it's been uh, really good and, and you know, in, in my opinion, for the, for the San Diego Police Department. And we're proud that we really took a leadership role in this. Um, and, you know, I think it's, again, important, you know, when we talk about policy, that we brought in a lot of stakeholders from community advisory boards, the ACLU, uh, politicians, our, our police association, a lot of people call it a union, but it's association out here in San Diego, to media, to a lot of different groups. And I think our, our first initial policy had about a 95% agreement. Think about this. You can't get a 95% agreement usually with your best friend on where do you go to dinner. And we did it with a body camera policy. And here's why. It's back to this conversation that we're having is that check your ego at the door. Okay, be willing to listen, be willing to compromise, be willing to understand, and what are you all trying to accomplish? And when you can set those ground rules, um, you can find a lot of common ground. And here's another important point. We didn't let that about 5% where early on we were never going to agree deter us 
from the 95% where we were going to agree. And, you know, we updated the policy. When I was chief, I think I updated it three or four times as I learned new things. And we learned new things about this new technology. We updated the policy as it should be. And so the policies are living documents. Um, and that goes again to best practices. Now, were we perfect on day one? No. Um, did we have some, you know, some starts and stops? Yep. But there's a, there's a big difference, I say, between, you know, a mistake, especially on new technology and misconduct. And, you know, huge mistake. Uh, or, you know, it, it would be wrong to lump them together, uh, especially as you're trying to learn this, this new technology. And, you know, I have to wonder, you know, there's a quote, uh, you know, Thomas Edison vetting, you know, the light bulb. Um, that, you know, some people said he failed a thousand times. And he said, no, uh, there was a thousand different progressive steps to invent the light bulb. And I have to wonder if, if you know, Thomas Edison, you know, was trying to invent the light bulb in the era of social media, uh, you know, would we even have the light bulb? You know, because people, he would be attacked so many times from people saying, you failed again. How much money did you spend? But look how great, you know, technology is and the light bulb. Um, so, you know, whenever you try something new, and I think you must to be progressive, continue to try new things. Some are going to work. Some are not going to work. Some might work a little bit, but you should always seek progress in what you're doing. But if you're not perfect from day one, you know, you, um, you better grow with a, a real thick skin, especially if you're a chief of police, because, you know, every critic is going to take a, you know, take a swipe at you. But, you know, um, I believed in the body cameras. And quite frankly, I'm very proud that we were, you know, one of the first, if not the first major city by population to really go forward and implement this. And I still hear from chiefs, you know, across the country talking about, okay, you know, let me learn from you. What were things that, you know, you wish you would have done earlier on now that you know more things. Um, and so that's how we learn and share from each other. So again, it, it goes back to your question about different technology, different equipment. Um, we shouldn't be afraid to try new things, uh, but you need a, a robust policy and you need to bring stakeholders together so everybody understands what you're trying to accomplish. No, thank you for sharing for that. And going into a little bit about um, body cameras. And I just want to emphasize that I don't think that the community is asking for perfection, but equality and truth. We are asking to see the truth of what's happening. See, we're asking for positive results. We're asking for consequences for when things like this goes wrong and it, it's incorrect. And we see police brutality towards that. And I just wanted to also say that something you said about, well, don't be scared of the um, new technology because, um, or things like the police shields and stuff like that is used to keep police safe. But at the end of the day, um, as a community, are we looking to, yes, we wanna keep police safe, but we're also looking to keep the community safe. And I think that these um, weapons and these forms of technology that we are seeing, I think they're being used more to keep police safe than to keep the community safe and I think that's how the community is feeling and so when we're saying we want to see less of this technology we are saying or these um, types of weapons or types of defense mechanisms we're not saying that please don't need to be safe yes we know that you signed up for a very um, hard job and a very dangerous jo job that many people have no experience in and have no idea what it's like on the inside and I thank you once again for your perspective of that but as someone who is in the community, um, I just wanna say that we are not looking for um, the continuous use, I would say, of these defense mechanisms as a way to um, keep police safe from the community when I don't feel as though the, the community is really a threat, but more of the, the community is seeing the police as a threat. So with that being said, I know I'm kind of jumping around a little here, but yeah, I want let me, if I could just respond to a little bit of that, because I don't want you to misconstrue something that I, that I said. First of all, we want everybody to go home. We want everybody to be safe. Uh, it's not, it's never us versus them. I said that early on. It, it must be we, okay? It has to be we. 
um, sanctity of human life is our highest priority. Um, and, you know, when any time force is used, it's never going to look good. It's never going to look good. Um, and that's why, again, if force is used, you know, by policy, you have to, uh, you know, you investigate that, you see if it was in policy or not within policy. Um, so often, um, you know, and that's where investigations come in. And, and again, it goes back to the trust of what is that policy or what is that procedure? Um, the, uh, you know, I, I am uh, really a, a huge uh, advocate for best practices, which includes technology, includes equipment, but again, it has to, you have to have that understanding of why you have it there. No, thank you for that. And I think um, we definitely got a little bit more insight. And I know you mentioned that it's not us versus them. It must be we. But I think there is a difference between what is and what ought to be right now in the country. Um, what is, I feel, and I feel many people in the community feel as though it is a very much us versus them. But what it ought to be, like you said, is that it should be we. We should be together. We should be on the same page. And that's what we're hoping to reach with having conversations like this. So I thank you for that perspective. And I want to direct the conversation in a little bit of a different direction as we um, wrap it up a little bit. So I want to ask you, uh, where do you see the country going in terms of police reform? Do you see us moving forward to a more peaceful era? Do you see us staying exactly where we are now? Um, what do you think is gonna be the future of police reform or the future of policing? Yeah, and, and I thank you for that. And, and I will tell you with um, leaders like yourself and others that I've had the opportunity to speak with across the country that um, really wanna get an understanding. And, and that's why it's so important to listen to a wide variety of voices because my experiences you know, growing up, um, your experiences growing up are gonna be completely different. And you know, let's face it, um, Stories have been passed down, terrible stories, you know. Um, how did policing start? You know, wh why, why police officers began? You know, it started with, what was it, slave patrols. And, and uh, you know, so as these stories are passed down or a negative experience with a police officer and that story is told and that story is told. And, and that's why it's so important that we take the time to listen. We take the time to understand. And I loved it when you said, we're not looking for perfection. Um, and that's great uh, because what we should all be looking for is progress and getting better. Um, you heard me say about best practices. I'm a huge advocate for going out there and seeing what is the best practice maybe working in another city. Can we implement something like that here? Whereas others have contacted me here in San Diego to say, tell us about this program. Um, and, and by the way, it's not just gonna be one program or, or one you know, entity or anything. It is gonna take a lot uh, of time and effort, but it's so worth it. And so to your direct question is where do I see policing going? I'm a glass half full type person. I, I truly believe that when we are looking at this time in the history of our country, when historians look back at this time in our country, that they're gonna be able to say that we made sweeping changes and not just in policing. I know we're just talking about policing, but when you go back and you, what I said early on about society safety nets, we can't just say that it's a police department. We have to look at all of these entities, the bigger society pictures, where we talk about reform and improvement and progress in not just policing, but all of these entities um, that will create a better society for all of us. Uh, as I said before, we would welcome a lot of these other entities to help share, as we say, in the responsibility to create safe, vibrant, thriving communities. Nobody should feel fear 
wherever they live. Uh, they shouldn't feel fair about walking outside and being a victim of crime. They certainly shouldn't feel fair for you know, coming in contact with a police officer. So how do we continue to work together to make sure that that, that doesn't occur? And I will tell you, I'm a huge advocate of listening. And I've learned today, just talking with you, I hope maybe something that I've said will resonate with, with someone else. St stop the pointing figure, stop the blame. You know, let's check our egos at the door and let's do the hard work. It's easy to say defund the police, you know, a hashtag. What does that mean? And what are you really trying to do when you say that? And let's make sure we don't have unintended consequences that we have seen already with some heartbreaking results uh, with longer response times. Um, you know, probably a lot of different reasons why violent crime is increasing. Um, in many cities across our country. Nobody wants that. So it's, we're not gonna help the matter if we're gonna point fingers and, and you know, get into our own silos. We gotta break down those silos, really find some common ground, understanding. And I truly believe that if we're all willing to do the hard work, um, we should always seek improvement, seek progress, that we'll be better off for it. And like I said, it's, it's my hope and desire that when historians look back at this time that they said, boy, we really seized this moment uh, and made things better for everyone. And not just in policing, but in all of these other entities. No, thank you again for those insights. And I definitely don't believe it's about point taking blame, but I think it's about taking accountability. We not only need to hold ourselves accountable, but held, held each other accountable on the same standard. And to do that, I think we will be able to listen, like you said. And I can only hope and pray that our country moves towards a more peaceful era of um, policing and a more peaceful era where we can all coexist um, peacefully. And before we finish the discussion, I would like to hear what your advice would be towards the Gen Z, millennial and adult community who say ACAB, to those who say that all cops are bad because of the current events, what is your advice towards them? Could you give them a little bit of hope that maybe not all cops are bad or we can hope that in the future, all cops won't, won't be considered bad? Yeah, and, and you know, when you say all of this or all of that, um, that is just wrong. Um, you know, it'd be like saying all of this community or all of that community, if you're saying all of police officers. And, you know, you're, done, you're lumping everybody into you know, one category, and we should never do this here. You know, we talk about bias training, implicit and ex explicit. Um, we need to break it down as to, you know, what are we really saying here? And what are we trying to accomplish it? And, you know, accomplish. And when you go and say all of this or all of that, that's, that's just not helpful. And I would tell you, you know, being a police officer is, is a privilege. It is a sacred commitment to protect society, often the most humble and vulnerable amongst us. And so I said, this is a privilege that we willingly accepted when we became a police officer. Um, and so we have to, you know, again, with our community, you become a police officer because, you know, I'm speaking for myself and those that I speak with also, you know, the officers across our country, because you truly want to make a positive difference, caring, compassionate. As I said, I joined the department thinking it would pay for law school. Fell in love with being a police officer because you get to on that one-on-one -on -one or you know just the you know a small level, not in a theater with thousands of people that you can really make a positive difference. And you know, um, big advocate of community policing and you know going walkabouts, you know, and, and knock, knocking on random doors. I used to do that, you know, from, from early in my career when I was chief of police, walking into a park, walking into a business, and just having these great conversations. And I would tell you, the vast majority of the people, they want police officers. They, they and we need our community, and, but we also need our community support uh, in order to be successful. And it's not just wanting police officers, but they, you know, they want police officers, but they also want good policing. 
what you said, you know, to your point, they want not just a police officer, but good policing. And that's what we want to, we want, you know, the very best, uh, which is going to cost more money, not less money, constant training for the best practices. Um, and how do we move, move forward from there? And I do want to bring this up because I think it's, it's really important. You know, you talk about millennials and, and all this, and everybody is glued to their phone. This is the one ask of you that I am going to ask. Please don't look at a headline and think you have all the information. Please don't look at a Facebook post and think that you have every bit of information that you need to make an informed decision. Not a 240 character tweet either, or a Snapchat, or a 30 second TikTok. Um, we need critical thinkers that can really drill down as to what is true. You know, and you gotta ask yourself, how has technology undermined trust and civility in society and so many of our millennials are glued to the phone. Um, and that's how it's gonna be, you know, getting their breaking news, breaking news and only getting a little bit of information. Um, so I think it's incredibly important and the advice that I have is that you be the critical thinker, be willing to do the hard work. If you've never met a police officer one-on-one -on -one like this, just to have a conversation, seek a police officer out. Um, bridge that gap, get that understanding. Um, and we will be so much better as a society because of it. And again, Hannah, I'm so, uh, so thankful to have this opportunity to have this great conversation with you. I, you know, I think you and I could speak for days mm -hmm. on so many different topics about this. Um, and again, if nothing else, just, you know, thrilled that, you know, willing to listen, willing to hear a different perspective, uh, find that common ground to, to move forward. No, oh, thank you for your insights and I truly appreciate it. And I also believe that our community will also appreciate hearing what you have to say coming from a police perspective. I do believe that we all need to be more educated. We need to be informed on the matter so that we can make educated decisions. We can make educated opinions because that is how we, we will be able to reach a point in where we can find solutions for this issue. And we can see things like community policing. We can see things where we're rebuilding that trust between the community and the police. And I hope that we can finally reach an era of that. So I do believe that this was a great discussion and we were able to have that conversation that many across America wish they could. So thank you so much, Chief Zimmerman, for being a part of the Next Gen Talks, the future of policing. And to all of those who are watching, thank you. And we hope to see you next time. <laughs>